When they first heard about this thing, it was crew expendable. The next time they sent in Marines, they were expendable too. What makes you think they're gonna care about a bunch of lifers who found God at the ass end of space? You really think they're gonna let you interfere with their plans for this thing? They think we're, we're crud. And they don't give a fuck about one friend of yours that's, that's died. Not one. I ain't much for begging. Nobody ever gave me nothing. So I say, fuck that thing. Let's fight it. Fuck it. Let's go for it. You're listening to Perfect Organism, the Alien Saga Podcast. Welcome to Perfect Organism, the Alien Saga Podcast. I am your host, Jamie Prater, and I'm joined by my co-host, Patrick Green and Christian Motzka. Welcome, guys. It's been a while. Yeah. It's been a long while. It's been the better part of a summer. Yeah. We've all been gone on vacation, um, but we are back, and we are here with uh, two very special guests to talk about the new Alien novel, Alien Inferno's Fall. Joining us for this discussion are the authors, Philippa Ballantyne and Clara Chartia. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. So, yes, we are here to discuss your new book, Alien Inferno's Fall, and uh, there's a lot to talk about. I'm not finished with the book yet. I'm probably the, the – well, Christian has read it and listened to the entire audiobook, so I could never compete. And I know Patrick is still reading it as well, <laughs> but I probably read the least or listened to the least because I'm listening to a book on tape. <laughs> <laughs> real to real yeah real to real yes as it was meant to be on the gramophone <laughs> so we're going to protect jamie by not getting too far into spoilers um but hopefully we can still discuss the the characters who are introduced and you know, get where this book came from and your inspiration and things like that yeah and for listeners who might be worried about spoilers we are deliberately as christian says we're not going to go below the thirty thousand foot soft floor on this thing but we will talk about characters and themes to some extent. So if you want a totally cold, if you're one of those people like like Dan Forlito, for example, who may or may not be listening to this, who does not watch any trailers or read anything about something before they you know interact with it, um, don't listen yet. Go read it, which you should because it's fantastic, and then come back and listen. And if not, you know, um, if you haven't read it yet, we won't spoil too much on this uh, program tonight. And uh, and yeah, and just as Jamie was saying, this has been really exciting. This is a novel that has a little bit of a special connection to us in some ways because Clara, of course, is a very long time friend of ours. And uh, this is uh, just from a sort of a fan perspective, a really exciting moment that you've, uh, you know, after all of the amazing consultative work that you've been doing and all of the expanded universe work that you've been involved in, this is like a real uh, credit, you know, for you. And and that, that in itself just makes me as, as a friend and a fan of yours outside of this really proud. So I guess maybe, kind of to sort of start things off, can you give us a little bit of a window into how you got affiliated with this project, Clara? I had been like consulting on alien uh, books for quite a while. I consulted on um, Aliens Phalanx with Scott Sigler, but my first consultation was with the RPG. So with the RPG, I got my name out there and then um, I consulted with Scott Sigler, which was around the same time. And then that book got famous. And then obviously, you know, I'm, I, I was a fan of Alex's and I was always talking about uh, alien stuff. So they were like, well, shit, I'm going to have to get her onto my team <laughs> if I want to get things straight. So, um, yeah, I, I just consulted on uh, Into Cryptus and uh, the studio started to recognize me for my work. And then um, when Titan approached us with a proposal about uh, write, co-writing a book, uh, with an adventure at the back and, you know, letting us put our own flavor into the whole thing. I was really excited. And when I heard that Pip was a New Zealander, I was like, fuck yeah, you know, A and Z. <laughs> yeah, Anzacs. Um, it was really, really exciting to be able to 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 make the the change from like a fan creator with Studio Yutani and having like content created through there as a fan and then slowly pivot myself towards more uh, professional sort of roles where I guess now, you know, I'm a, 
a published co-author thanks to Pip and and thanks to like the supportive people at Titan and also the studio who believed in me. So yeah, and also thanks to Alex White for uh, giving me the opportunity to be able to get myself out there and, and believing in me. <laughs> I cannot appreciate their their kind words and support enough. If it doesn't get said enough on this show, which it, it doesn't, although we say it frequently, thanks to Alex White for many things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. They're responsible for many awesome things in the world. Yeah, I'm really excited to be able to hopefully work on more things in the future. This may not be the last you see of me. Hmm. <laughs> well, that is exciting. And Philippa, how about mm-hmm. you? How did you get so into alien that you decided I want to write a book. What was that like for you? Well, um, I'm an old fart and uh, <laughs> I used to, uh, when, when this sort of idea came up, I thought immediately back to uh, the eighties and my college years and how my D and D group, every time after we finished D and D we'd get fish and chips, which is very New Zealand and sit down and watch aliens. And we were just, you know, you know, it's one of the most quotable movies of all time. So I was like, when this opportunity came up, I was like, yes, this, this is, this is it. Also, I called up my old D&D people and said, I guess, I guess it worked. Um, and of course, Alex was just like telling me how amazing Clara was to work with. And I have known Alex since for like over 10 years, we go to a writing retreat, my husband and I with Alex and so if they say that someone's good people to work with, I trust them. And it was just amazing to work with Clara. We're fantastic. We just meshed. It was great. Yeah, it was so much fun. I felt like there was a lot of good <laughs> chemistry there. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of Trello's. <laughs> oh, my God. And how, how much we matched on, like, so many inspiration and ideas and we just kept on, it just kept on snowballing. We yeah. had to stop ourselves. We're like, this is too much madness. We've got to save some for another book. <laughs> Precisely. Yep. What is a Trello? <laughs> it's basically a shared whiteboard so that you can create different sort of um, shared. I like, I'm a former librarian, like library cards of various different things. So, you know, we would have one for characters and we would have one for inspiration and we would have one for tech, you know, that sort of thing. And yeah, because, weapons, mythology, characters, all of that. ethnicity, nice, yep. I've, I've actually, when I was living in New Zealand, I actually collaborated with the person who la- later on became my husband. And so I know that the most efficient way is to have one person in America and one person in the Southern Hemisphere because... When Clara was asleep, I was working. And when <laughs> I was asleep, Clara was working. So we'd always have this cool stuff to wake up to in the next the next morning. Mm. Yeah, if it I can get even, really well. <laughs> even nerdier about an already nerdy potential wormhole opening up in this conversation. Uh, Trello, you, know, for you, might, you may both know this, but is inspired by Toyota's manufacturing processes, which gave rise to lean management principles that are called Kanban. And Trello is a con- so it's actually it's you know Toyota was pretty revolutionary with how they manufactured cars right yeah so like if anybody at any time had the ability to stop the production line etc et so like yeah we actually use that at work too it's a really cool <laughs> really cool program that I'm happy to nerd about with you after I'm done recording if you would like to because yeah. <laughs> yeah sounds I fun I thought it was going to be like a New Zealand candy bar that you both <laughs> like <laughs> I wish I could get some New Zealand candy bars over here. <laughs> The book has such a strong voice for having two creators. I think that speaks volumes about how the two of you were able to work together. And there were moments where I definitely could say this was Clara, you know, Clara, um, her love of androids, although maybe I'm wrong. Maybe someone else here loves androids. I love androids. I think we both love androids. I think we had a a long discussion about uh, synthetics and, uh, the treatment they've had in various um, alien properties. And, you know, sometimes they've had the short end of the stick. Yeah. So we wanted to show that there was like more than one type out there, I guess. Like there is so much more than what we've been shown. So there's different levels of like technology and what they're used for and how people can manipulate them. Or I guess like when you are introduced to other characters, you have the inside look of what the processes are for those androids and kind of get a glimpse into how they think. Mm. I think we ended up with like five or six different kind of androids at least mentioned. Yeah. 
definitely a lot of worker bots as well. Yeah. So uh, before we get even further into this discussion, would one of you mind setting this, setting your book up for us? What's the, what is Inferno's Fall about? Okay, Clara, you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh dang it! I'm winging this. Okay. You're the canon so, mistress, so, my friend. So basically, <laughs> basically, Inferno's Fall takes place in two one eight six slash two one eight seven. It's kind of takes place after, uh, of course, uh, into Cryptus and Colony War, and it kind of takes the whole inspiration that they've been drumming up through the RPG and Aliens Fireteam Elite about where the border bombings are coming from and who is actually instigating them. And we're introduced to a place in the Whalen Isles called Shanman, which is a UPP uh, run colony on a previously 3WE planet. So you see, um, I guess you get introduced to, uh, what is it? I'm getting too specific now, but I do want to mention it. Uh, Alan Dean Foster's contribution to canon in Alien Covenant Origins, we've got the Jiteau Combine. And, like, because I'm Chinese and I felt like some of the portrayals were a bit too vague, I wanted to reclaim that. Um, I, you know, made sure that it kind of fit within, like, the whole, like, uh, UPP and CANC, which is, like, the, the Chinese arm of the Space Republic, kind of, like, combined their powers because like you know the Chinese have that, that capitalist economy and the UPP want to use their resources so they join and then you have Shanman. Now of course all of a sudden uh, while mining is happening and things are going on and there's consultation from like these new um, characters which are the not which I'll let Philippa introduce after I talk about this stuff. Um, the a juggernaut uh, arrives at the colony and people are like, what's going on? And then, you know, a rain of black death hits them and the rest is pretty much history. But I'll let uh, Philippa explain the other part. <laughs> well, the, um, the the main characters on the mining side of things are indentured um, miners. So they're from New Zealand and Australia. Um, they are found family. They kind of like assemble various people that they that they like and that they get on with. And they uh, have formed this company called The Knot so that the other companies understand what they are. Uh, and they are unfortunately very much tied to the Jutu Combine because they the only way they could get off Earth was to become indentured. And so they are specialists uh, that have been brought in to um, sink a deep, shaft uh, that they've tapped out all the other resources and they're going deeper and so they've just turned up planet side on the just the really the wrong moment uh, <laughs> and have to cope with a really bad moment yeah so like there's there's lots of um things that are going on and of, of course in the um the summary of the story they mention um like a, a what, what what did they say? A somewhat experienced colonial marine, yeah. And of course, like Zula is on the front, yeah. So it's obvious who it is. I mean, like, but there is another mystery person on the front which wasn't revealed until, you know. Yeah. But some people guessed. Yeah, they did. They did because they're all mm. they're, they're clever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's so it's it's all about like these everyday working hard people trying to survive um uh, I guess a pathogen attack and like because of like the really great response from I guess alien or the shared history of Australians and New Zealanders being diggers in the war it made sense having a mining colony since like Australia has a lot of like mine sites and we have a history of mining as well that mm -hmm. um we would try to make the most of our talents and head up into space after because I'm um, what people don't know is that well, Canberra gets nuked in the alien universe. Yeah, I was, I was so of, surprised about that. <laughs> because of the food riots or, or the, the RPG calls it the food wars and mm -hmm. they add on to canon about that. A Christian might be able to help out with a bit of info about that. Well, it was a, it was a minor footnote in one of Steve Perry's novels 
where he had taken the the original Dark Horse comics and made novels of them. And he just flippantly mentions, oh yeah, you know, when Australia got nuked and and left it as that. And then I think um, Andrew Gaska in the role-playing game in, in his hours and hours of research, like, okay, that's a detail that needs to be fleshed out. And I'm sure that Clara was like, yeah, let me help with that. But it does speak to something. Your, your novel is so wonderfully character-driven while at the same time, and as you were just rattling off, Clara, you're referencing William Gibson's unproduced Alien 3 screenplay. You're referencing patch details going back to the very first film where Kane has the Three World Empire patch. All these different various elements, things from, from Alex White's novels, things from Fireteam Elite, Alien Isolation, but you've brought them all together and you have stitched them together so nicely that it just feels like a beautiful tapestry and not like a laundry list. So I wanted to praise that aspect of the book because in the end, all of that is secondary to how we feel about the characters in the knot. And for me, they hit very, very hard. So Thank you. Thank you so you much. You have no idea how much <laughs> that makes me feel good because sometimes I feel like I read all the books and sometimes I'm like, wow, this is a moment where they could have mentioned this or they could have mentioned that. And like, this moment would have been so much stronger if it was connected to this. And I really wanted this for the book. I wanted people who were familiar with the extended universe to go, this part is linked and it's, it may be just aesthetic or it might be an actual link. Um, I want to demonstrate like one of the, the links, which is not a spoiler, is that um, some of the not actually live up on a space refueling station, um, which is mentioned in Dead Orbit. Now, Dead Orbit is a massive station, right? But that's so far in the future. And I had to think, okay, where? How, how did this massive space, in, space station come to be? I watched heaps of sci-fis. I think a good example, uh, unfortunately, not a very good movie, no offence, um, is um, Valerian, City of a Thousand Planets, and just the way the space station grew. And I kind of took that inspiration and said, like, this space station is actually close to this planet, it could exist. What would it be there for mainly first, refueling? And how could that be a port and what would people build on it? And it would be like Singapore, like slowly build up and be big. And then obviously because of the mutations that we see in um, dead orbit and we don't know how things have happened on there, um, we kind of demonstrate, okay, if that's a, a refueling station now and it became an experimental science station later, something close by must have happened. Something was being studied and we have no idea what it is. And now I've given you the answer. They were studying Shunman. They were studying the pathogen and they were experimenting on people. So, you know, it was just a very like loose connection, but people who knew and read the comic would then know the outcome. I love that. <laughs> Sorry, I got a bit excited. No, no, that was, no, that was I, the, I, one of the best things about working with Clara is just that. I love the fact that she pulls all these different disparate threads across so many different kinds of media together and knitted them into the fabric of this novel. And I really love that Philippa has made like really full three-dimensional characters, which I know Jamie is always talking about having a character-driven story and how it would be really great if we had a film or a TV show or anything like that. And I think Philippa really delivered on that. And I'm so happy, proud, and honoured to work with her because, oh. like, it was just amazing to have such a great book, such great response from people. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, in all of the writing that I've ever done, character has always come first to me because if you're not spending time with interesting people then why are you reading a book and if you're writing about horror if somebody is just a cardboard cutout of a person then you're not going to care if they're you know going to get an encounter with a xeno you know it's like <laughs> you know, it's like watching a like one of those wooden targets just fall over you know you got to make some people that the reader is going to care about I just want to say that Philippa actually made me care for a character who I thought was going to be very two-dimensional and that's Nathan. Because <laughs> he felt like he was a plot point. Like he was a point to get into the town and, and, and explore some stuff. And we, we, were, we were looking at things through the female gaze. So, you know, Nathan sleeps with a guard. The guard is a woman. I don't know why someone said it was a guy. 
It's mm. weird. Um, so so that's um, that's that's the key of it. Like she made me care for a, char- for a character, which I thought was just a plot point, and I was like, wow, his relationship is actually genuine with this, you know, yeah. uh, guard. And then like, wow, he's actually a really sweet guy. He's good with kids. So like she made me care for someone who I honestly didn't think I would care for at all. And I think that's the magic in what she writes. (laughs) Sorry, we'll stop blowing gas up each other's ass. (laughs) (laughs) I know. It's so hard. (laughs) <laughs> that is fine. No, that, that's what we're here to hear about. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Nathan is a character who initially I was kind of rolling my eyes at, but it also grew on me quite a lot too. And he actually highlighted something. In, so two kind of behind the scenes conversations we'd had. One that I want to get, circle back around to, which is uh, what Christian was alluding to with how stitched this is to everything. And Clara, your amazing work, especially on that. Um, I want to kind of come back around to that. But before I do, uh, something that I was really struck by as I was reading the book is that like even a hundred pages into it or more, there really like are very few characters in it who um, have like my sort of perspective as like a, you know, traditional white cis male. Like there's just very, very little of that, which is extremely refreshing because uh, for one thing, there shouldn't have to be, but also because I was really struck by the fact that this was like a very female driven narrative from the very beginning. And that informed a lot of creative decisions along the way in terms of how the knot functions, in terms of how deference works in the minds. Well, the I've, I've written male and female characters in, in my fantasy and my steampunk novels. I guess the form of the knot um, it just comes back to my own experience in a family with very strong matriarchal figures who, you know, have held the family together through war, um, the men going off, um, all sorts of um, that sort of thread runs through them. And I think, you know, um, the definition of what a strong female character is, I mean, I love Ripley. She was one of my foundational characters but I also think there are other ways for women to be strong and so I wanted to make Toru uh, particularly uh, strong but not necessarily in a like a full militaristic way Um, she's you know the family is everything to her and she's going to sacrifice we ended up with Zula just I can't remember how we ended up with Zula but we she was right there and she's a fantastic character and so she ended up being uh, the head of the, the jackals, which we bounced around. And then just it seemed like female characters were just falling into the story at various points. And, you know, um, I think Alien and Aliens have always been about strong female characters and this is just a different form of them. Yeah, um, I think we also, like, people also like commented on the politics of the book and stuff like that. And they've got to understand like the context of that. Australia is really laid back. We believe in same sex marriage. LGBTIQ people are everywhere. We're a melting pot of everyone. And so is New Zealand. So when they complained about those things, it's like, well, that's Australia. (laughs) Um, I can't change my upbringing, because I was talking about a lot of my personal experience as a Chinese Australian. Philippa was talking about, you know, what her experience was having lived in New Zealand and then obviously of living over in the States now. Um, a lot of the stuff that we included in there made sense because of um, it's also uh, it's a socialist uh, outpost, the UPP. They're not communist. So we have uh, social health, social, you know, education, but we've also got indentureship. So we wanted to make a comment on people who are asylum seekers or who are migrants who get um, exploited, like in Australia with the fruit pickers or um, with people who are travelling. They they kind of get the raw end of the deal. A lot of them get exploited. So we wanted to, like, focus on that. Like, what would a refugee be like from Australia if they had no home to, to go back to, no food for their family, how desperate would they be to, to keep their family safe? And, and then Ukraine happened and it was, it was kind of reinforced what we already thought 
And it was kind of really painful as well because that was toward the end of the book for us. And and it hurt me uh, a lot because, like, my uh, father-in-law is from former Yugoslavia, you know. Uh, I am familiar <laughs> with the Soviet Union and everything that's been happening. So it kind of, like, really compounded the whole, like, this is a political war. Um, we have to genuinely show what each of these political alliances bring. And we were just showing you what it's like to live in the UPP as a slave, as an indentured servant who can't leave, who is restricted in class um, and not only minority. This was like a class war. I don't know why people saw races because, you know, Australians multicultural, New Zealand's multicultural. Race is not a thing. Ignore the races. Ignore people's sex and gender identity. We're talking about a human story, a subclass of people being treated less than human and not given the opportunity to bring themselves up from ruin. And we'll, we'll see it live in Ukraine. You know, you can see it's been over six months and or over a year or whatever to the day that they've been battling. And we know that those people are dedicated that they're strong, they're, you know, all different coloured people, all different ages, races. We've got, like, everyone of different abilities fighting for survival, and that's what we're talking about. So we wanted to really strip it back to what Alien is about, survival. So for those people who are angry with the politics, you can use your imagination. Imagine everyone is white and see how you feel about it then because I guess the idea is, like, we want you to care for other humans and not every human is going to think like you or act like you but not everyone is out to get you and sometimes you do have to put your differences aside to survive and that's what alien is about and that's how we got the knots Mm -hmm. sorry another rant (laughs) that's that's definitely one of the main main themes is that when you're in desperate times the only way you're going to survive is to pull together and that i think is a that's a theme an alien as well is also the and the underdog always getting the short end of the stick. So it's it's no different to me than any other. To me, um, I've written science fiction, I've written fantasy, I've written steampunk, and everything is politics. It just is. <laughs> I, I do like the point that you've brought up, um, though. Uh, both like uh, Jamie, Christian, and Patrick is that is very female driven. Mm-hmm. Um, we're females. We're going to write from our point of view. <laughs> write what you know. I mean. Yeah, exactly. Um, the first and, thing we tell you. <laughs> yeah, and, like, I can tell you uh, for Philippa's writing, there were only a, f- a few suggestions that is, like, can you change this person to a trans person? Can you change this person to lesbian? And then can you change this person to, like, you know, non-binary or whatever? Because that's that's representative of my friendship group. It's not a rare thing for me to come across these people. Those are my friends. I I went out to drag bingo last night with, you know, uh, two trans people and a gay person and a straight person. You know what? We had fun and no one fought. There wasn't a big giant riot or a fire. Um, And and we had fun and, and had drinks and talked. So, you know, like at least with this book, we wanted to kind of turn a lot of um, alien stereotypes on their head. So about like, you know, in, for example, uh, sorry, guys, spoilers for alien prototype. So Zula is um, training some people on a colony, but then she in, uh, encounters a sex synth working as a science lab assistant. And then you see through the male gaze how the scientist looks at her. And like, she's a strong character, but that male gaze is still there. So Philippa, in all of her, like, wiseness which I really love is that she's like okay how about we have Carter how about we have a sex synth who's been reappropriated for work and like what would the female gaze look like toward an android and how can we show people that experience for him for uh Toru uh being a, a sexually active older woman um all of these sorts of things to kind of challenge people's perspectives of what they think they know already about the alien universe. And I think that was a really important thing that happened in the book. Personally, I don't believe 
synthetics have things. I'm more in <laughs> the line of like Ridley Scott saying that, you know, Ash doesn't have anything and that's why he's frustrated. But we've come to an agreement that, you know. <laughs> we, we had a Trello. It, oh, oh, we yeah. had a Trello. We had arguments, but <laughs> it was all good. Carter is is a sex synth and, um, you know, like Dave, the, the, the relationship that Davis had with Zula was not sexual. It was, you know, they were in love with each other as people. So we see asexual relationships. So there's a lot of like different sort of relationships that are in the alien universe where I don't think people realize. Mm. And when they read our book, they were confronted because we make it really obvious because we point it out. But in other, there were trans people in prototype. Yeah. There were gay people in like, (laughs) several other books and like I feel like people are picking on us because we're women <laughs> we, we uh, took them from those books and yeah shit man pick up a book <laughs> read them <laughs> and then come complain to all the other authors because like uh, I think you're really missing out on some really great really interesting uh, in-universe details because they are that re- that way for a reason because they're a representative of who we know anyway another rant sorry <laughs> Well, I had a general question in terms of what you could and could not do. Obviously, there's a lot of ties to everything, the films, the you know other novels, the comics. Was there anything that the studio was like, oh, you don't – you can't do this now or you can't use this now or we'd rather you not use this? Or was it like, hey, do what you want to do? Well, we had been given uh, the vagueness of the colony war, the the – at first, I my assumption was, and I should have clarified that, was that it was going to be a traditional uh, trilogy where one book ends and then you ne- the next book and then the next book and the same characters. But they're not like that. They're more like this is what's happening in the colony war over here with this group of characters. This is happening with there. And the- so um, w- once I knew that and we were given, uh, I can't even remember, Clara, how we came up with the with the the pathogen drop was part of the idea that we had to work around um but because i mean i'm gonna get uh, we my, came up with the mining com- colony yeah we came up with the mining side of it i remember but yeah the vague idea of the p- pathogen drop was sort of the only real instruction yeah and the yeah, time period much. obviously yeah the time period really restricted us so we weren't going to see you know david in his actual capacity, we're not going to see Ripley 8 or no. Ripley or even Amanda Ripley. So it was really concentrated, I guess, because of the setting of where it is and when it is. And then I just had to kind of draw um, the inspiration from that and say, we can link to this and that and that and that. There was, there was still a lot of really good, juicy stuff to work with. And because we had to produce, I think it was like a 12, 15 page um uh, synopsis of what we were going to do, which is far more detailed than I usually do, because I usually just wing it, shall we say, pants it, <laughs> as we say in the writing business. Um, but it was really great because we came back to that in, again and again. And I don't think we really uh, drifted away too much from that original. No, it's, um, it pretty much stayed the same. Like we we changed the order of a couple of things because mm-hmm. we got mixed up with our day and night cycle. I think because we had to, we had to keep track of time. We had to keep track of distance we had to keep track of um, the passage of time for each of the characters when we're going from the knot and to the fury yeah. that's right so, we had to add a couple of uh, chapters that sort of brought them into the same time stream situation yeah but uh no there wasn't really anything that they screwed in well we we weren't supposed to-, to mess with the engineers but uh <laughs> we 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 got close to them we got close <laughs> <laughs> We we they they were they were really good to work with actually it was it was you know I this is my first uh, tie-in novel that I've ever done and so I was a little bit like I mean Alex had assured me that Titan were great to work with but you don't know until you go into this sort of thing and so I was just I just was you know I I said can I you know do certain things and they were like yeah they didn't say anything about that and I was like oh okay. Oh, all right, okay. <laughs> and so we we had a we had a good time. There wasn't any too many restrictions. Just you know, little minor quibbles about you know things that you usually get in the publishing sort of sphere. So 
Hmm. What I really? think the deaths, some of the deaths were a bit graphic, so they said. Oh, that's know. right, yes. Wait, I had to dial back my child murder. Yeah. You know, yeah. just a notch. Just take it down from 10 to, you know, 5. Yeah, from 10 to newt. <laughs> <laughs> Bodies, but we don't want to see it, that kind mm. of thing. So with the border bombing, the, the pathogen drop, which I, I know comes at least in part from Destroyer of Worlds, the, the role-playing game supplement by, supplement by Andrew Gaska, this is the most firmly alien covenant slash Prometheus style of novel. Uh, previous novels have, have flirted a little bit with some of that content, but this one is, this is a full-on like prequel inspired alien novel. But was that, was that well-received? Was there some pushback on that? Or were you allowed to just run with all the new possibilities that that brings about? When they said like, okay, like how does the pathogen work in your book? Because like when we started to write it and stuff like that, um, when I started to introduce other types, forms of uh, mutation aspects, they were like, we need to find out exactly what this does before we approve anything. So I made a 16-page slideshow with all of the information <laughs> from all of the films. Oh, you're going to give uh, them information. If you ask Clara, yeah. she's going to give you a 16-page yeah. PowerPoint presentation. And it had, it had the references on the back for each of, like, what, what I believed the pathogen did in each iteration of its, like, portrayal. Um, and then I said, there you go. And they were like, could you make it a little shorter? <laughs> we don't want Sorry. to read the whole thing. <laughs> I was like, oh man, I really worked hard on that. But they did. Apparently they read it. Um, and, and, and like, that's how, uh, we were able to say like, this is how it works. Cause I got the, the help from like an actual, uh, radio chemist and I've got help from people who were in mining we did research into the periodic table and um, mythological uh, elements and also uh, elements that don't currently exist but we've numbered things like that so uh, I guess I'm a foremost expert on the pathogen ever since I read the cold forge because it just clicked for me with um with Prometheus, with Alien Covenant, and you know how much I love the prequels and I love the other films. And it just made total sense that um, maybe there are elements out there that can bring order to the chaos that is the pathogen. And Shanman contains that um, mineral, but that mineral is rare and it's spread out throughout the galaxy. I can even tell you scientifically how it exists because I've actually gone and like presented it so yeah but I won't go into that that'll be <laughs> maybe there'll be another podcast yeah the traditional alien life cycle as beautiful and amazing as it is there is a danger of it becoming too well trodden but the, the ground has been covered so many times and so you know no spoilers for the the second half of the book or whatever but it was so exciting to have the book hit the ground running. You know, when, when certain things kick off, there doesn't have to be that moment where someone is careless and looks into an egg. Things just, I, I, oof, you just have a, a tidal wave following certain characters. So I was very excited about that. I'm a little lukewarm on the prequels, but as a way of exploring new ideas under the banner of Alien, I'm all for it. And this is one of the prime examples of taking those ideas and creating even more interesting stories, more character-driven stories, thank you, Philippa, than what the prequels gave us. So I'm all for it. I think it's fantastic. I don't know how familiar, like I don't even know really who can talk about this or who can't talk about this, but I do know in terms of life cycle and some elements that you introduce are also going to be introduced in a certain film coming up soon. They're very similar. Do you guys know this? No comment? No comment. <laughs> okay. I, I was reading, I was like, it's, okay, it's, this is... It, like our ideas came out before the leak of the TV show. And it just like, I think it's just when you're working within the same uh, inspiration, you're going to come up with the same ideas. Like, you know, how many people in the comic books or the books have done a decapitation of an Android, you know, or done leaning into the egg or, you know, all of those sorts of things. Um, and we just happen to touch on things that, 
the TV show was looking into as well, and that was purely by accident. We came up with the idea uninfluenced. Hmm. Yeah. We have no affiliation with the TV show or the film. We were never privy to any information. It was a happy accident. I do think, though, and this has come up a couple of times that there, and this is sort of actually going to loop back to my, my other question. I feel like as an alien fan, the last eight or nine years have really been the birth of like a truly interconnected, expanded universe. Whereas most of my formative years growing up reading S.D. Perry novels and Alan Dean Foster novels and Dark Horse comics, they, it felt very sort of disconnected, like just, you know, different sort of, you know, episodic adventures, little picaresque things on different planets and things. And then I really feel like the prequels, for better or for worse, and I say that wearing a Covenant shirt, so for me it's better. <laughs> Um, I, I feel like the, the prequels did a really good job of cementing new ideas in place that were very explicit in terms of, you know, mutagenics and transhumanism and how androids are treated. All these things that were kind of implicit in other movies were really like forefront. And I think that uh, a lot of people got very excited about those themes. And I think that we really saw, for example, like I, I think that without the prequels, you wouldn't have had the Brian Wood comics that gave us Zula Hendrix. And I say that not because they're thematically very similar, because they're really not, but because the way Davis is treated in those books, to me, echoes a lot of the ways in which we see Walter and David and other androids treated. And I feel like, you know, through books like this, through other, I think Titan has done an amazing job because they've done so many new properties based on this, you know, between Phalanx and all these different avenues that it can take. Um, and I think Marvel is continuing that trajectory of having, you know, new and interesting stories going. And I feel like as a fan, and of course, Gasco with the RPG, there's a real sort of enmeshing going on. So those sort of, you know, simultaneities make sense to me because like people are really thinking of, about new avenues to take these stories down. So my question for you both is, did you feel that it was liberating or was it, did it make it more difficult to have that much more of an enmeshed creative sort of template to work within? Because now you're working in a place where people are, have certain expectations or have their timelines written down and they're sort of waiting to see where things go. Was that liberating for you or not? Interestingly, when I started off, I thought it would be quite constricting. Uh, I thought, okay, so there's this, there's this law, which is all wonderful, but is that going to kind of, Linker me to just having to be able to do us only able to do certain things, um, but in fact, it turned out to, for for me as an author to be quite enriching um, in ways that I hadn't expected, and uh, uh, all of that is obviously due to Clara's encyclopedic knowledge. But <laughs> the fact that there was like we had a meeting, we had a meeting with um, uh, Cold Iron, and that was just like. You know, Chris Etoile is like, you know, uh, oh, amazing. Chris is amazing. amazing. <laughs> so good to work with him. Amazing creative. And the fact that we were able to like have a meeting and discuss how we could put some things from their, um, uh, from the video game into uh, Inferno's Fall was really great. Plus, timing was amazing. And uh, uh, Fireteam had just come out. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, screenshot, 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 <laughs> screenshot. I mean, as a writer, I mean, there was just so much to draw on. I was sitting there writing, listening to the soundtracks. I mean, I was watching the uh, pathogen drop on repeat. Um, I found it really pretty amazing to be able to just dive into that um, law in such an amazing way and having Clara just make sure I got it right. <laughs> I think I think we should also mention that it was it's thanks to um Nicole Spiegel at yeah. 20th Century Studio to help facilitate the the cross collaboration between uh Titan and Aliens Fire Team Elite and you know like you know drawing on like the the past history of Zula um through Dark Horse and stuff like that like she she's she is part of the reason why we're able to be able to to connect because she understands that alien is better when we collaborate and that collaboration can take on many things like i guess in the past for example the reason why things didn't connect is like people were told like for the comics you can kind of it's really hard when you're kind of tied down 
on law and it's really hard to explore radical and, and strange and different ideas. So when you put those sorts of restrictions on someone, sometimes you do end up with the same story over and over and mm. over. And and comic books have to come out with new stuff all the time. So it worked out better for Dark Horse to kind of go off and, and do what they felt like. And it, it, it worked out for, you know, uh, the the RPG or computer games or whatever to like, this is what the director wanted and they put their vision or their flavour into the alien universe. I think for this one, because, you know, uh, as, uh, Cold Iron Studios were drawing on very similar inspirations in the pathogen and our book was focused on the pathogen. Um, some of the, the weapons from their timeline suited our timeline. It just made sense to include it all. So it wasn't hard to do the collaboration, I don't think. It wasn't restrictive. But I think in the past, without that connection, it would have been harder for creators or directors or comic artists or writers to kind of adhere to an ongoing singular lore because, like, we only had Alien and Aliens and then a comic book came out and then they changed it because Alien 3 came out and then uh, Alien Resurrection came out. They had a post-comic for that and it just got, like, you've got the different flavours from each of the films but none of them truly connected. And I feel like the pathogen actually did that, you know, as as Christian pointed out, or and or Pastor Patrick pointed out, for better or worse. Um, but I think it's magic, and it it make it's, it's made its mark, and it's here to stay. I just want to congratulate you guys on the cover. Covers are a big deal to me. Most of the alien covers that come from Titan are terrible, terrible. Yours is really great, and I don't know how that happened, but. For me, it's, it's also about the cover as well as it is about the story and the character. So, bravo. I think I think it's my fault because I just annoyed the shit out of Steve at Titan. <laughs> I'm sorry, Steve. I love you. Thank you for fighting for me. I really, really wanted a good artist on the cover, and he delivered. And 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 I'm in touch with that artist. I I talk to him all the time, and he's great. So, yeah, uh, the fantastic. Yeah. Job. I mean, covers are always like a bit of a. Um, a dice roll for writers because sometimes you get input into them, sometimes you do not. Um, my very first book cover I got, it was a total dice roll, but it w- ended up winning a fantasy award for the best cover, and I had nothing to do with it. Uh, and the same happened with this. It was just like, here's your cover, and you're like, yay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I must say, like Steve, he, he spent a lot of time looking at Alien Covenant looking at neomorphs to make sure that they had the right amount of fingers, the right amount of spikes, <laughs> they had the right mouth. So it's it's all on Steve. We blame Steve. Thank you, Steve. But thank you, Steve. now now he's delivered. He has to keep delivering. I know. That's the problem. But you do People it well. like, oh, how come this cover's different? I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> he can do it, uh, but only if he's got someone to annoy him like me. <laughs> it should be your title, Clara. Yep. Annoyer in chief. <laughs> Annoyer in chief of Alien. <laughs> Do you each have a favorite character from the book? <laughs> I'll let you go first, Clara. Oh, it's so hard. Um, I love Pinar <laughs> and her show. Um, oh, yeah. Because, like, I, I, I actually was when I was younger. Um, I, I had severe allergies, and I was going to hospital all the time for treatment and stuff. So. Uh, that was the, kind of the inspiration of Pinar. We needed someone who was allergic to the world, sick, but she was still capable and still useful. And it also is kind of a link or a callback to the Cold Forge and into Charybdis with, with Blue Marsalis mm-hmm. uh, because, you know, she was a brilliant mind stuck in a decaying body. And it shows as well how useful those sorts of people are in this universe. Like even Veras in Alien Resurrection, he had to have a mobility piece so he could keep working because there's no one is going to take care of you. You know, the Mm. the company is not going to pay you um, injury wages or anything. I don't think there's anything about insurance except for company property. So, So pretty much if you're a disabled person, you're pretty much fucked in the Alien universe. If you don't if you can't contribute. And and that's the sad thing about Pinar. Like she loves to contribute, but she shouldn't have to. People should be able to take care of her. Um, but I also love that, you know, the alien universe isn't too precious about disability. 
that these people are super capable to become the last survivors yeah. um, or, you know, be taken down. So, so yeah, like it was, it was really important to have Pinar and, and have her kind of representative of what I felt like in, in early life, I was very vulnerable, but then older in, in life and given, given the right tools, um, I became very capable. So, so yeah, Pinar's my favorite. <laughs> That's cool. I never realized that, that that was your favorite character. Yeah. Well, apart from Zula, of course. <laughs> well, everyone loves Zula. Yeah. Well, my my favorite character. I mean, I love Toru, but May because she's just so fun to write. So, can I tell you a story? Does anyone want to hear the story of May? Yes. <laughs> yes, we do. Of hilarious. course, I, May is a fantastic character. I would love to hear more about about her. So, in the original um, idea, we um, it was going to be Davis. Davis was going to be right there next to Zula, just doing his thing, helping her, started writing, got, I don't know, about a quarter of the way into the book. And uh, Clara pings me. (laughs) She says, "Um, just so you know, uh, spoiler alert, uh, Davis is dead. (laughs) You can't use him. And I was like, okay, because he was the main, he was going to be the point of view character for that. Um, and so it was a little bit of a problem. And so there's this, there's an old writer's trick that when you are tr- describing a new situation, the way you do it to avoid the whole info dump is that you have somebody who's new to the situation and they walk around going, you know, what's that? Who's that? What's happening? That kind of thing. And so I was like, okay, well, that would be cool. I, maybe I could have a character like that. And so that's how Davis's daughter came into being. And I was like, Clara, <laughs> could, could, could Davis and Zula have a daughter? <laughs> and then I had, um, I'd watched like a lot of sci-fi. We've seen uh, Westworld. So they've deconstructed human beings down to algorithms. We've seen, you know, uh, Altered Carbon. We've seen, you know, the matrix we've seen all of these sorts of things where like there are there is a digital identity of human beings that can be transferred into code and then if what if we could mix that code like when humans have a baby they mix their dna yeah and then the baby comes out as you know both representative of the mother and father sometimes in more ways than others sometimes in looks sometimes in the way they think yeah. and then we thought you know what can can may become and so we were looking at the very i guess in universe the very first synthetic made by a synthetic kind of um because they had help um and then we also see the amalgamation of like what that synthetics um view was of a human being and the traits that they admired and what they thought were good traits to put into their child and pass on to ensure their survival. So it's it's really interesting uh, way to investigate uh, transhumanism, the way to investigate uh, digital identity, uh, how the the future is biomechanical, you know. <laughs> the relationship so, um, between synthetics and uh and fleshy mortals um is is very intriguing. I also I I was I patted myself on the back, you know, uh as far as the small detail where Davis did turn up <laughs> in her head. Because, you know, we've all had those moments where you're doing something and you can suddenly hear your parents' voice in your head going, oh, you, you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> and I was like, wouldn't it be irritating if Davis was in her head and she couldn't get rid of him? <laughs> Oh, I think yeah. it's a brilliant comedic device that I, I actually, it's like one of my favorite things in the book. And also like the fact that we meet May in the body of like an adult android right but yeah. acting like a child <laughs> and trying to get her mom's attention who's like not interested in her with her dad's like voice in the back of her head and she's like super frustrated because she can't decide whether to listen or to not listen and but there's also really nice meditations on there i think in what it means to be a parent and what it means to be a child there's a, a beautiful line that you'll probably correct me on because you wrote it but something about you know it's it, sometimes it's both beautiful and annoying to hear the voice of your parent in your ear or something <laughs> so there's also a really nice meditation on, on that in here i think yeah yeah i think 
uh, yeah, there's, there's definitely parts where she is frustrated and angry, but also worried that he's going to go away. So, you know, that that is also something that humans deal with. So, you know, I, I really enjoyed writing her and getting in her headspace, which is something, again, that I didn't expect out of this out of this project. Um, you know, there's sometimes there are just characters that just crop up wild in your head and you're like, where did they come from? And then they inhabit you. And so she's still in there. <laughs> yeah, I do love May. I'm sorry I didn't mention her as my favourite character. <laughs> I was just so jazzed to, to have Pinar. Yeah. Um, I'm just but, glad you could, we could have two characters that we could. Oh, yeah. And, like, it was, like, when you came up with May, I was like, hmm. I was like, I don't know what I feel about this. Because, like, <laughs> it's like. I'll make this, you love her. Yeah, this was new. It was different. Uh, and, like, you know how you, when you introduced with new information and you're resistant like I was with Alien Covenant and I did a lot of hate watching of that um, I started looking into all of the, the transhumanism stuff and, and and what we perceive what it would be like if we were to integrate with technology and, and what could our futures look like and then I was thought you know what this is the next step and it, this happens later on in uh, what is it um, Alien Resurrection with the mention of the Android Rebellion mm-hmm. and like the and the the what the autons, the synthetics who are mass manufactured by synthetics and they were more human than human and that's what May was going to be. And, like, to be able to bring in, into canon, I guess, uh, one of the first more human than humans because, in, of course, um, in a non-Titan book, in a, a Macmillan publishing book, Alien Echo, hello, um, Mira Grant, Cena <laughs> Maguire, thank you. Um, we, we had uh, one of... Uh, Olivia's spoiler alert for people sister who was an android who was created by her parents who was an imitation of a human and then took aspects from her growing up sister to kind of build on her personality so we've got uh, a more human than a human android made by people and then we've got more human than human android made by an android um, and then we'll have like the mass manufacture of the androids further into the future, and like, and then we have like a very Blade Runner esque sort of rebellion. So we have, you know, the the Autons want autonomy, you know. So you know, it's it's all about free will. You know, do we have free will? Are we born into expectations? Is our fate spoken for? Because of our genetic upbringing, you know, are we prone to make certain decisions and May is a really great exploration of that because you can see her pondering on ideas or like even like the scripting, like no spoiler for this one, you know, Davis suggests a joke and she's like, maybe this isn't the right time, you know. (laughs) Learning stuff. Yeah, learning stuff. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And like we go through that sort of stuff all the time when we talk to our friends, like, well, like I'm thinking of a really funny joke right now, but this is probably a little inappropriate. I'll gauge it later, you know? So I guess Philippa's talent is to make you kind of uh, feel for an Android for the first time and like worry about their choices, worry about what's going to happen to them, uh, worry about, you know, like have an Android worry about their future. Like no Android I think has ever really thought about (laughs) that. Am I going to um, die? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's 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 something that like I guess all humans go through as well. So it was really refreshing to see that from May's point of view. May is in a combat synth body, isn't she? Uh, out of yeah, out yeah, of uh, one of those fire team so elite. She, so she looks just like a combat synth. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's such a wonderful visual metaphor for not for for her inability to communicate easily with other people, like. She doesn't have those skills yet, but she also physically doesn't have the ability to make her face show emotion. And I just felt like that, that was a nice pairing with that character. And with Pinar, I love that her arc, um, right. She, she has opportunities to prove her worth, but also the mission that she goes on uh, ramps up the horror of what's happening on this planet. Her story leads to a revelation about how much worse things have gotten. So I was very excited with that character. No spoilers. Me too. Yeah. I was like, this is fucking cool. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. I was like, woo, woo. 
I'm so, so happy. <laughs> if you had the opportunity, would you two want to collaborate on another alien novel? Mm. Well, I, guess it, it, I think it depends on the success of Inferno's Fall. So if you love the book, please, 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 please put your review on, you know, Google Books, Amazon, Goodreads. Talk about the stuff that you liked that we included. Feel free to talk about the stuff that didn't work for you. And try not to take offense from our, you know, our politics in our country. <laughs> and then, and we're women, you know. And then we're women. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I can't talk from the point of view from a man. I think it would be a bit weird. It might come across strange because, like, you know how when guys try to describe a woman in a book <laughs> and it always comes across a bit like male yeah. gaze and, like, oh, you know, fo- focuses on, like, the body and stuff like that. It's never about a feeling. So, like, I guess Inferno's Fall really digs into Feelings, feelings for androids, feelings of family, feelings for loved ones, for lovers, for, you know, uh, one night stand partners, for people who do sexual favors, for people who are just, you know, uh, casual acquaintances, Mm. you know. So, you know know what I I realized as you were just saying that, you know, how to me, Aliens is a story about mothers. Yeah. This is also a story about mothers. Yeah, this is this is an <laughs> aliens version of a of a prequel, I guess. <laughs> Lots of mothering going on, without actual mother in it. Is and, and oh, the AI does. Has anyone spotted the Easter egg with um, the AI on the ship? I was trying to figure out why it was named what it's named, but I did not. I did okay. not put it together. Are you going to tell us, or are you going to let the boys guess? Uh, let's let's just say if you. Do a bit of research into the naming of the parents of certain writers. You will find the answer. Hmm. Hmm. And most of the stuff ties back to inspiration from Joseph Conrad and Ridley Scott. So <laughs> look it up. <laughs> right. A little treasure hunt for people. Yeah, I, I put a lot of treasure in there. It should be a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for everyone to find everything. <laughs> it's been it's been so hard to keep my mouth shut because I'm usually analyze this, analyze that, but I have to wait for people to find the good stuff. I've put a lot of um, good stuff in there, and hopefully, mm-hmm. hopefully, they're excited when they find it. It's like a trifle with many layers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited to continue. Over. I'm excited to continue reading. Like, I'm not the biggest reader. I used to be more when I was younger, but. This is actually hearing from you guys, hearing what you put into it, just the work that you did to make this book what it is excites me more to get into it. So thank you so much for that. I had a quick couple of questions for both of you in terms of, and I know I'm a little bit more familiar with Clara just because I've known Clara for a while. We actually met up in Santa Monica about yeah, three weeks ago. Yeah, that was so much fun. Before, He's a good hugger, everybody. <laughs> before Clara's nightmare uh, plane ride home. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> um, but so my questions are, and maybe I'll ask you first, Philippa. Mm-hmm. Favorite alien film and why? It's always going to be Aliens for me. I'm sorry, Clara. It's always going to be Aliens for me. It was just such a formative time in my life, and I I just loved Ripley. I even liked Newt, and I was one of those kids that, oh, like, every time I saw a kid, I was like, oh, God, here it comes in a movie. It's going to be a cute kid. I even liked her. It's aliens. It's just aliens for me. Clara's going to say something different. <laughs> we all know. We know. Everyone at once. <laughs> we know. One, Alien two, Covenant. Three. Alien Covenant. Covenant. <laughs> It's what reignited my love of the series and, and for me made all of the films click together. So I know it as, as much as people dislike it. If you read um, Jonathan Rinsler's uh, book on Alien, um, you will see where a lot of inspiration came for Alien Covenant. And a lot of it, yes, it was, you know, ideas that they never carried out back then because they didn't have the technology or they weren't good ideas at all. But, you know, the writers of the film saw value in it and so did Ridley Scott. And I guess in the assemblage of the film and the parallels it takes with Dante's Inferno, um, there I am rambling again. I love the film. I love the art references. I love the poetry. I love the characters. I love, you know, everything about it. (laughs) 
And we got the pathogen. So, you know. And we got the pathogen. Well, I know that we could probably continue on. It's been about an hour and 20 minutes. So I think we should wrap. Um, perhaps, you know, when more people have read the book, we can have a discussion at some point and have you guys back on. Yeah. Patrick and Christian, do you guys have anything else to add or ask? No, just thank you for writing a wonderful alien novel. Absolutely. And we had a lot of fun doing it. So, <laughs> Well, and yeah. it shows. You, you both seem so happy to talk about it and to to you praise each other so nicely you know and it just, we can just see that your skill sets combined beautifully yes absolutely. well i just know that clara is gonna i just think she's just gonna do more and more amazing things so i'm just proud to have a little bit in the story of clara <laughs> oh i'm i'm happy to to be paired up with a, a best-selling author who in her own right with her own series just completely blow people out of the water you can see all the praise that philip has had she's obviously haven't hasn't lost her touch and and obviously she's going to go from strength to strength and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what she has in store for all of us awesome well thanks for coming on and if you've read the book as clara has mentioned please give the book a review so whether where you buy books or audiobooks review the book give it your best go and maybe there'll be more maybe yeah Definitely. And, and don't forget people to follow Philippa on her socials. What are your socials, Philippa? Oh, my gosh. I am a Pip Valentine underscore author on TikTok. I'm doing TikToks. It's crazy. <laughs> wow. I, on there. I don't know. They let me on there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can uh, find me on. Weirdly, I've been on Twitter like since the dawn of time. So my author name there is Philippa Jane. Should Thanks again, can- everyone. Find me on Wolf and Mother, Clara, yeah. In, yeah, Instagram and Twitter, Wolf Mother. That's my name now. Not Mother 9000, not Alpha uh, Echo, uh, sorry, like Delta Echo Alpha Delta, de- dead. Um, I don't know. I've changed my name so many times. <laughs> <laughs> JM's finding it hard to keep up. Just I know. Wolf Mother. <laughs> I had to like the other day. I was like, "How do I?" I was going to m- send you a message, but because your message went down, I was like trying to type it. I'm like, "Oh no, I have to type it in backwards because your name." Like, <laughs> <laughs> she changed her name backwards on social, but uh, yeah, now funny. I can't change it back for like I think 30, 60 days or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, always pushing the envelope. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, thanks again for coming on. We really appreciate it. Best of luck with the book. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks. Really lovely Bye. to be on the show again. Bye. Yeah, nice to see you again. Nice to meet you both. So uh, first off, thank you again to Philippa and Clara for that incredible interview. This book is wonderful. Pick it up. Follow them on social media. And also, because this is the first time that we're officially recording something in like two months, we got some new patrons. And I'm going to go ahead and read those names right now. So get ready for your pronunciation to be butchered. And here we go. We have Nolan Eller, Jay Hansen Law, Abir Tarafdar, Yossarian, Amanda Fisher, Blood Hut, Stephen Riquez, Richard Alonzo, Vincent Harris, and Steve Paterson. One T. I think it's Paterson. Um, and also Blood Hut. I, I, we said this uh, when we you know, gave you a shout out on a Patreon episode. Uh, that's my favorite name so far on our entire list. It just, it's just so evocative. So thank you to all of our new patrons. We are so appreciative. We hope you've enjoyed the new content. We just dropped a misery episode. We're about to do a special round table, special edition of frame rate on prey, the new predator movie, which we're all dying to talk about. So, uh, and as well as many other things, which we're very excited to, you know, let you know about so thank you to everybody who's joined up we'll do a full read through of patrons on another episode coming up but in the meantime thank you so much uh, for, for joining thank you thanks for listening for more on perfect organism the alien saga podcast please visit perfectorganism.com perfect organism is available for listen or download through podbean itunes google play Tune in and Spotify. If you'd like to support the show, please visit perfectorganism.com forward slash support. Thank you.